Let me start from the right to introduce the head table. On my, well, let me start with the left because that is the trend that is going from left to right. Adnan Murani, a doctor from Cleveland, a member of the board for a very long time, who has sustained the commitment of the Cleveland and Ohio community to the objectives and purposes of the ADC. On my immediate right, on your left, is Abu Adia, a very distinguished scholar which I will introduce later on. Next to him is Adnan Murani. I'm sorry, no, uh, Ray Irani. Ray Irani. Mazin, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, Mazin, you are supposed to tell him that I had a Freudian slip which is a financial dimension of it. <laughs> Mazin Irani is one of the most outspoken members of the board of the ADC. He has enriched its discourse for many years and his commitment is unwavering and I would like everybody to express their appreciation for the effort that he has made. And then, well, I don't want to say finally, but Naila Asali, the chairman, chairperson of the board, you know, I have to be politically correct. The chairperson of the board has steered this organization beyond the expectation of the optimists. And therefore, I would like all of us, towards the end of this convention, to give Naila Asali and the members of the board the applause and the ovation they deserve. While my name is Clovis Maksud, allow me, and I know I will get a beating later on, to express also my great appreciation and admiration for the work of the president of ADC, Hala Maksud. Needless to say that the members of the National Office of ADC have done a yeoman work. This convention would not have been possible was it not for their commitment, dedication, and clarity of purpose. So they, the staff of the ADC stand up. Where are they? Staff. I'm going to take exactly one minute to say that last year's speech was far better delivered by Najla Edward Said than what we are going to listen today. Edward Said is the pride not only of the Palestinian community, but of the Arab community and what he calls the constituency of conscience throughout the world. May I introduce Dr. Edward Said? Thank you very much.
Thank you. No, no, sit down, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Let's see. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and officers of the ADC for uh, inviting me, in spite of my non-appearance last year. Um, I think. I think. Uh, my daughter's, uh, my daughter Najla's performance, um, as Clovis says, will far eclipse anything I'll ever do. Uh, but you, you, you're very patient, and I'm, I'm uh, deeply grateful for the uh, honor you've bestowed on us uh, for having us here, uh, Najla last year and me this year. I'm also grateful to Clovis, who is always such a good friend and uh, selfless in his support of his friends and, and causes in which he believes. There are very few people like him in the Arab world or out of it for that matter. So I, I think uh, everybody recognizes his, uh, his superb human qualities. I'm also um, pleased having been, as many of you here have been, at the, one of the people who was involved with ADC at the start to see how much ADC has done in the last uh, what is it, 15 or 20 years of its existence. Not only because it's by far the largest Arab American organization, but also because, m much more important, it has gone further than any group before in creating a kind of community identity for the Arab Americans and giving them a kind of presence in the society which um, we've never had, for all kinds of reasons. We come from many different parts of the Arab world. There are all sorts of things that separate us. We've come at different times, different backgrounds, different interests and um, associations. But I think the presence of ADC as a protector of uh, Arabs against stereotyping and um, attacks of one sort or another, and the beginning to create a positive identity uh, is, is a, a truly a tremendous thing, and I, and I think it's very important that we, um, that we recognize how far we've gone. We're, we're, we're great at recognizing, and I am too, at how little we've done, but I think it's important at moments like this to recognize that we've done a lot, and uh, we've, we've, we've accomplished a great deal, and that's something uh, that we should feel positive about. Now, the topic that I was given by uh, Hala was the Arab-American agenda, or an agenda for the future, political and active, which is, of course, much too big a subject for me possibly to, to deal with. So I'm going to talk about it in a very partial way, offering what I can, building on personal experience, because I think in the end that's the most valid, and then uh, I'll try to generalize here and there, but I hope also that we'll have time for discussion and questions uh, after I've finished. Now, one of the things that uh, should be noted at the outset is that this is a very p particular time in the history of, uh, of uh, the modern world. It's not only the end of the century and the millennium, but it's for the first time a world that is increasingly, I won't say dominated, but it's certainly increasingly uh, influenced by expatriate and diaspora communities. I mean, if you think to, that today, for instance, Sweden, which, which is certainly the most Swedish country in the world, uh, now has a population of over 15% non-Swedes. Uh, so this presence in many of what used to be extremely homogenous uh, countries like France and Britain and uh, elsewhere in Western Europe, but also in Australia and other countries, 
uh, Latin America, uh, you recognize the presence there of large numbers of people from other parts of the world. And of course, this is nowhere more true than it is in the United States, which is, of course, an immigrant society, a society made up of immigrants. And in that, uh, uh, in that panorama, of course, the Arabs have a very particular place. This is a multicultural society, and I think one of the things that ADC has pioneered is the, the role of the Arab Americans and their culture in a multicultural society, which is not only that of the white wasps, but also of Latinos, of African Americans, uh, Chinese, Asian Americans, and so on and so forth. So that's a very important thing to note, that we are playing a role in this uh, diverse and extremely mobile world. It's a world of tremendous dynamic change. For the first time in history, the national basis of states is changing and taking on the identities of many new components in them. In England, for example, the Caribbean and the East Asian communities have changed Britain from a country largely dominated by white people to something quite different. Uh, the mix is uh, very important, I think. Now, the, peculiar, <clears throat> the peculiar, peculiar situation of this country, I think, is even more recognized because when I came here in the fi early 50s as a student, the idea was that you studied, let's say, the humanities, and that was automatically understood without any question to be the Western humanities. You read Shakespeare, you read Dante, you read uh, Dostoevsky, you read uh, um, Milton, and so on and so forth. In the th almost 40 years that I've been teaching, the whole idea of the humanities has changed to a multicultural one, where the humanities are considered to be the province of the entire world. So students today, instead of just reading, although they were important things to read, Plato, Aristotle, Homer, Virgil, etc., now read the Quran, they read the great books of the Confucian tradition, they read the Japanese tradition, they read the Indian tradition, all in keeping with the fact that the recognition of multiculturalism in the United States has become a fact. And I think this is a new opportunity for us uh, to assert our presence in this, uh, in this new uh, mix. And I want to talk about that in, in a minute. What gives our situation as Arab Americans a particular, uh, let's say, twist or tension is the fact that alone of all the regions of the world, there is a kind of political tension between the United States, the dominant, or at least the home society in which all of us live, and the part of the world from which we come. It's not entirely coincidental that as we speak today, the United States is still bombing Iraq on an average of once every three days that sanctions against several countries, several Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries, uh, economic sanctions against them are maintained by the United States. That the sense most of us feel as a community, and one of the reasons for the existence of ADC, is the sense of hostility between the United States, the dominant culture of the United States, and the Arab world, which is evidenced in the media, in, uh, 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 in, in schools, and, and so on and so forth. I don't need to talk to you about that. You all know it from your own experience. We're still an ethnic community, uh, pr racially profiled, singled out for a, particularly, for a particular form of hostile uh, attention. So I think this gives our situation its, its peculiar identity. And I, that's what I want to talk about, uh, especially today. And the, the, both the challenges uh, and the realities of that. And I want to begin by mentioning to you something which um, my father told me uh, when I first came to this country, I was 15. My father had come to America uh, in 1911 from Jerusalem. He had escaped uh, Jerusalem because he was about to be drafted into the Ottoman army to fight in Bulgaria. So his father said to him, you know, there's, there's no point in your being cannon fodder for the Ottoman army, run away. So he did and he came here. He lived in the United States for 10 years. And during that time, he served in World War I in the American army in Europe. He served in France. But the experience of those years, my father was a very laconic man. He, he wasn't given to long speeches, um, very lapidary, laconic advice. 
And just before I left, I was 15 at the time, to come to boarding school here, he said to me, Edward, I have to tell you something. When you're in the United States, try and stay away from the Arabs. <laughs> Not knowing what he meant, I asked him for explanations. And, and his one-line explanation was, the Arabs will always pull you down. That was the experience of most, I think, Arabs of his generation. That it was a disparate community, it wasn't a community known for its internal cohesion. And indeed, for the first 10 or 11 or maybe even 15 years that I was here, I had nothing to do with Arabs. I went to schools where there were no Arabs. Um, and indeed, I had very little contact with them because I didn't live here. I was a student, and it's in, student, in places uh, like the universities and colleges I went to, there were very few Arab students. Um, so it wasn't really until the, the 67 war that I found myself a member of a community for the first time. And what brought us together as a community was a collective defeat, which gave us an identity in the society as the peculiar scapegoats of everything that was wrong with the world. Uh, we were the fanatics, we were the terrorists, etc., etc. And I've lived this experience, as have all of us, in one way or another. And I want to give you now just two or three little anecdotes to tell to just to give you a, a sense of the the world I live in which is the world of you know of the university of thought uh, of culture and so on and so forth how we look in that world in 1980 a publisher my, my publisher in New York asked me to give him a list of novels from the third world for translation into English he was interested in putting together a list I mean in his publishing house which was a commercial very well-known commercial publishing house. And he said, if you could give me a list of writers from the Arab world, from Africa, elsewhere, uh, we might consider them for publication. And I gave him a list, and at the top of the list was, um, this was in 1980, was Naguib Mahfouz, who at the time wasn't known in this country. Uh, eight years later, of course, he won the Nobel Prize. And as a sign of what that meant was that in the paper that was written, the column that was written about his prize, in the New York Times, the first quotation was from the Israeli consul, who had to, they had to get his idea. Do you, how do you feel about an Egyptian winning the Nobel Prize? Okay, back to 1980. I gave him the list and didn't think much about it until I ran into him a few months later and I said to him, Andre, what has happened to the list I gave you? He said, well, we're proceeding with some of the novels you mentioned. And I said, what about Naguib Mahfouz? You know, he's a really great novelist. Uh, and although he's not well known, I'm sure he will be well known uh, in time. So he said, well, we decided not to do it. And I said, why? And he said, Arabic is a controversial language. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the first story. The second story um, is uh, about a decade later, in the early 90s. Um, there's an organization which some of you may have heard of called PEN, P-E-N. It stands for Poets, Essayists, Novelists. And it's a worldwide organization of writers. And there's a very powerful PEN American center. They're organized in centers in every country of the world. And PEN American Center, I was, I was on the board of it, uh, on the executive committee for it. And so a number of people said to me, wouldn't it be a good idea, given what you've been saying about the ignorance of the Arabs and of Arab culture, I mean, I, it wasn't political, it was cultural, wouldn't it be a very good idea, I think I may have mentioned this earlier to, at, a, at an ABC convention, but it's worth repeating. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we had a meeting of Arab and American writers? Let's say we'll bring 15 or 20 writers from the Arab world, we'll get 15 or 20 prominent writers from America, you know, people like Norman Mailer and William Styron and so on and so forth. And we would have a series of exchanges, seminars, uh, meetings, public readings, and so on and so forth. I thought it was a great idea. And we immediately began to uh, put together a committee of which I was a member. Uh, and then there was a bit of a delay. And one of the delays was they were trying to decide on, uh, I'm, I'm saying things that, are, that will sound to you shocking, but they were actually said in meetings they were looking for a Jewish member of the committee. So I said, I mean, well, why is that an issue? I mean, why should there be a Jewish member of the committee? And they said, well, Edward, you understand. And I said, well, what does that have to do with Arab writers? I mean, if you were going to have an exchange between Israeli writers and American writers, you wouldn't think of putting an Arab on the committee, would you? They said, no. So I said, well, why in this case? 
So they said, well, it's a different situation. You understand we have a constituency. We don't want to offend anybody. So I said, all right, fine, we'll get. So they found somebody who seemed to be interested in the idea. But the point about it is that we tried to raise money for it. Uh, the budget was fairly small. I mean, it was like $100,000 for a, a week-long conference involving lots of travel and writers and so on. It was impossible to do anything. And this project is still on the books at Penn, and nobody wants to support it. Neither, neither the membership of Penn nor in the society where one of the organizers told me, you know, if this was a conference like the one you mentioned of Israeli and American writers, we could raise the money with one phone call. But we can't do it for the, because there is no constituency for Arab culture in this country. So that's the second point I wanted to make by way of a little anecdote to give you an idea of where we are. Um, and the third, uh, it's not exactly a story, but it's a, it's a fact that we feel as Arabs extremely uncomfortable when common and ordinary words have been associated with uh, things that make us uh, deeply troubled. Take the word peace, for instance. It's been hijacked. It means something quite different than it does for us in, in connection with the Middle East. Take the word fanaticism and violence and terrorism. Ask anybody. There was a survey done a few years ago in Canada where the word Palestinian was, you know, flashed and, said, and, and the, the, the test, the person taking the test was asked to immediately say what came into his mind. In about 80% of the cases, Palestinian triggered the word terrorism. Fanaticism, violence, etc., always associated with the Arabs, with Islam, and so on and so forth. I think that's, despite the efforts, the very important efforts of ADC to sensitize people to that, it's still the case that stupid films like The Siege were made last year, and that apparently, I read uh, Ali Abu Nami put it out on the internet, there's a new film coming out where, well, sort of like that Schwarzenegger film where he kills 80 Arabs in a, two frames or something. Uh, Arabs are always being killed, they're always associated publicly in the, in the public <coughs> mind, in the public image, with what is negative uh, and, and, and regressive. I think that's the general situation, and it raises the question is for the agenda. What can be done collectively as a community among others here, to change that, not just by reacting to a terrible film or a stereotype that we might see in a comic or an advertisement or a, a sitcom, but over a long period of time. I mean, what is the agenda that we should put for ourselves over the next 10 or 15 years? Given that, A, that we are members of this community here, we are members of this society, Arab Americans, as Americans, and we have a real continuing connection with the Arab world, which is very important to most of us. All of us travel there, most of us travel there. We have historical connections, we have family connections, and of course we have cultural and linguistic uh, connections. So the question is, what are the models for activism? What are the possible models for activism as Arab Americans Given this background, which I tried to sketch in, it simplifies it somewhat, but is, in general, I think it rings true. Um, and given also, and this is perhaps the most important point, that we are moved by notions of citizenship. We belong here. We are American citizens, and therefore we are participating in a society, and that we have to have a say in what kind of a society this is, what sort of policy it's going to have towards the world, what kind of country this is, where its relations with the Arab world are both very important, very rich, very tense, and have been problematic for a long time. It's a, it's a daunting challenge, but I think we have to face it. And what I'm going to propose in a very sketchy way are a few ideas that may be of help, perhaps not, but are worth, in my opinion, uh, thinking about and discussing. Now, I think the first point I'd like to make is I think it's very important to have done what we have so far done, namely to combat stereotypes that Arabs are not simply terrorists, towel heads, camel jockeys, the whole thing. I mean, I grew up with them. Ironically, my children, uh, a generation after me, also went to American schools, also grew up with them. So they're still there. I think it's important to combat them, but I think the next step is the one I don't think we've taken. And that is to give our culture, our heritage, our language, 
a real presence beyond stereotypes in this culture, in this society, in this, uh, in this country. Now what that means is, what this means is, I think a number of things. I mean, it's important, of course, that we continue with as meetings, uh, haflis and dabkis and associations, uh, Ramallah, Beit Hanina, uh, uh, Lebanese Federation, all of those, you might say, partial or local associations are terribly important. People, they're organic. But beyond that, it seems to me we have a terribly important responsibility towards making the contribution of our culture, which is really quite fantastic if you take, a, take the time to look at it, make it felt in, let's say, the curriculum, in the academy, in the university, in the school. I can guarantee you, and this is again something from personal experience, that I travel all over the country giving talks and so on, and everywhere I go people say, could you give us the name of a book that tells us something about the Arabs? We know nothing about them. We are, for whatever reason, excluded from, uh, for instance, there are every major university in this country has a program in medieval studies. Medieval studies means, you know, Dante, it means Chaucer, it means the founding of the university, the founding of the scholastic tradition, etc., etc. It's always assumed to mean medieval West. But the fact is, I mean, this is not something that we could even debate, this is a fact that the medieval West is incomprehensible without Arab and Islamic civilization. There's a book, no, no, this is, wait, it's important. There's a book, I, I'll give you an example, this is something that I have just learned, uh, and I feel myself, I'm sort of confessing to a tremendous lack in my own awareness. There's a very important book by an American, uh, Arab-American professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania called George Muckdesey, some of you may know him. I think he's retired now, but he was a student of uh, Louis Massignon, a great uh, French uh, Orientalist. And his book is entitled something like How Western Humanism in the West, you know, How Humanism in the West Came from the Islamic World. And it's a massive tome in which he shows that the previous notion held by people like Jakob Burkhardt, the great Swiss historian of the Renaissance, who wrote at the end of the 19th century, he was a colleague of Nietzsche's at the University of Basel. And his, many of you may have read his book, The Origins of the, of the Renaissance. It's a study of how the Renaissance arose in Italy in the 15th century, how people like uh, Pico della Mirandola, Ficino, Aretino, Sir Thomas More in England, all of these people were influenced by these amazing Italian humanists who discovered the heritage, really, of ancient Greece. And the way he describes it, Burkhardt and the others, Chris Teller, there's a whole series of important historians, it's as if it was like the major breakthrough self-generated uh, by these Western Italian humanists. Mahdisi, of course, who knows all of the languages, not only, not only, of course, Arabic, but also Italian and Latin and Greek and so on and so forth, in a very painstaking way shows that the whole concept of humanism the whole idea of the university as a place where discussion, disputation, argument, what, what were, was called in the, in the uh, late Middle Ages studia adabiya, was in fact the invention of the Arabs. And that what we know today as humanism was in fact invented by Arabs in Sicily, in the great courts of Sicily, of Andalusia, Baghdad, etc. That there is a direct link between our culture and the, cult, the modern culture of the West, which is always represented as having sprung, you know, like from the head of Zeus, like Athena coming out. Uh, whereas, in fact, there is, there is this incredible role that the Arabs have played, which is totally unknown to students, all of whom study in American universities, who study the Renaissance as the first great step in modernization of liberal education, humanistic interpretation, and so on and so forth. There's a massive pre precedent for that in the world. Now, Who's doing, who is looking into that? I mean, this is our role, you see. This is what I'm trying to say. And beyond stereotypes, beyond saying we object to being characterized as camel jockeys or terrorists, we have to now start to put in place precisely what it is that we are. And you can't do that by just saying, well, we have a very rich civilization, or 
Oh, the Arabs, and, you know, people used to say that Shakespeare was an Arab, really. Sheikh Isbir or something. I mean, that, that's no good. We live, we live, or, you know, how many Spanish words are really Arabic words? Al-Manakh, Al-Manakh. Al-Zaytun, olives, and so on, Al-Zaytun. So Fine, that's all very nice, but that's folklore. What I'm talking about is something that every community in this country whether it's the Asian American community, the Afro American community has done, is the discovery, the articulation, and the insertion of this culture into the main culture of the United States. We have not done this. We are irresponsible <coughs> in the extreme when it comes to looking at the curricula of universities. And it, we cannot do it unless we do it ourselves. In other words, I think we owe ourselves the responsibility, the, to transact the responsibility of acquainting ourselves at whatever level. I'm not just talking about kids, I'm talking about seniors like myself, like many of the people here, to understand what our heritage is and to actively promote it, its literature, its language and so on, in the society, in whatever form that is possible, whether it's the YMCA, the Rotary Club, the university, the school, etc. As I say, Every ethnic community in this country, every cultural community in this country has done this, except the Arabs. It cannot be done, however, without collective will. It can't be done by individuals. Of course, individuals do it. In Houston, for instance, I was down there a couple of years ago, or maybe it was last year, giving a lecture, and I, I discovered that they were starting to do it. What did they do? They organized themselves, and there again, overcame the differences between Lebanese and Palestinians and Syrians and Christians and Muslims, etc., identified themselves as Arabs, established a foundation, raised money, and established a professorship in uh, Rice University, um, which pro exactly promoted the study of the Middle East, and so on. I mean, I think this is a very, very important precedent to do this, where the culture at large, uh, in a sense, has, has no place for us at present, largely because we ourselves don't do it. But I was thinking also, uh, I wrote an article at the time of the Gulf War, where most people felt, I mean, you know, I have no, as everybody knows here, I have no love at all, and I despise Saddam Hussein and everything he represents. But Iraq is not, I mean, Iraq is not a desert country. I mean, Iraq is the richest of all Arab countries in terms of its heritage, its culture, etc. It's, it's, it's human and natural resources. But at the time, I remember that one of the justifications for bombing Iraq and for continuing to bomb it today is that it's basically an arid country. There's nothing there. They're just a bunch of crazy people running around, and it doesn't matter. Uh, so I, w I wrote an article about what, what I called embargoed literature, how little was known in the society about novels, about poetry, about film. All of this is something that can be done at the community level, where our literature, which needs to be translated I would say of all the major literatures in the world today, Arabic is the least translated into English. French is better. More translations into French than into English. But English, we are non-existent, largely because the community hasn't made that a, an imperative of its presence in this country. And that's part of citizenship. The same is true of film. The same is true of painting. The same is true of drama. One hears, there are people in this room here who have talked to me about projects to bring painting and photography and so on and so forth. This is... I mean, fantastically important, because this is, after all, a democracy. It's not a police state. So the only way, I mean, for example, our traditional enemies in the society, the Zionists, that's how they've done it. They represent in the society a positive valence, positive value, which is that, you know, that Israel, for example, and, and its cause is liberal, democratic, and so on and so forth. There are Israeli writers, there are Israeli speeches, there are Israeli artists, etc., all the time circulating, and very little of ours is known. And I think that is, I would say, the number one prerogative, I think, for the future is to set Arab culture by our own efforts in the uh, contemporary culture of this country. The second uh, aspect of this cultural thing is to uh, intervene uh, actively in discussions. Um, and, and ADC has pioneered this, I think, that whenever there's, uh, you know, there's some discussion or some reporting uh, the example, I, I mean, he's not here, so he won't be embarrassed by my singling him out. There's a young man at the University of Chicago, Ali Abu Ni'mi, who's the most extraordinary 
surveyor of the press I've ever seen in my life. He seems to do nothing but read uh, all the newspapers, listen to all the news broadcasts, the television thing, and he's constantly on the internet bombarding them with letters about their inaccuracies, their, their, um, you know, their, their, the stupidity of their, uh, their the biases and so on and so forth. We, we have to do that. If we don't do it, nobody else will. And as a result, we go you know, sort of by default, which is a situation I think that can't be allowed uh, to continue. So I think the critical intervention on the part of individuals and associations is terribly important to keep reminding the world, not in a narcissistic or ethnocentric way, that we are a real people with a real culture and that we have something very important to contribute, both historically and at present. We are very gifted writers, movie makers, uh, photographers, poets, uh, etc. These are e extraordinarily important. The second, the first is the cultural, uh, and I'm tr I'll try to go a little faster. The second is the, is the political. That is to say, whether we like it or not, um, and, I, and I have always been aware of this f from the moment I came to this country, that you always had a choice. You could either become an American and sort of forget your pa past. There was a teacher I had in boarding school. Um, allow me to tell the story. I was very homesick. I was 15. I'd never left home before. I went to this boarding school in northern New England, and I was told by a friend in Cairo that there was a teacher at that school who was originally from Egypt. I think he may have been a chamois, you know, some kind of Lebanese or something. So I was incredibly... 